Georgia Tech's 11th president, GP Bud Peterson. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, I think many of you know kind of the routine we've gotten in for the past few years is in the fall we do an all campus wide address where we try to update the campus community on what we've uh, hoped to accomplish during the coming year and then in the spring semester what we typically do is to try to do smaller group meetings. Uh, we've done a number of those, I think seven or eight of those throughout the course of the semester uh, with different academic units and some of the staff attended the, those and then we also made a presentation to GTRI but we like to do one large one for the staff so that if you don't have a chance to go to the individual unit discussions or, or presentations you have a chance to at least get a little, little idea of what's going on. So if some of you went to those and this is a little redundant, I apologize in advance. But what I want to do is just kind of give you up, uh, an update on some of the exciting things that are happening, uh, some of the things that are coming down the road uh, in the next several months or next year or so, and then give you an opportunity to answer some qu or ask some questions. Uh, so probably the best place to start is with the admissions update. And some of the admissions staff is here, and I have to tell you, they did a great great job. We went to the common application this past year. It wasn't a really good year to go to the common application. If you followed the news nationally, there was a lot of problems with the national platform for that common app and a lot of articles. It actually worked out pretty well for us at Georgia Tech because our OIT folks and the admissions folks were able to work together to overcome some of the bugs. Uh, but we saw a 46% increase in the number of applications for our freshman class from, for this, coming, this next fall over last fall's class. We had almost 26,000 applications for about 26 or 2,700 spots. Um, that, is a, that is an increase of two and a half times. So the applications that we received for next fall's freshman class is about two and a half times larger than it was six years ago. That 46% increase, we know that some of it is attributable to the common application. Uh, we talked to other, some of our peer institutions in the AAU that had uh, gone to the common app and they usually would experience a 20 or 25% increase. We did 46%, so we think some of it's because of the common app, some of it's because of the increased national and international visibility uh, that Georgia Tech's receiving, uh, and some of it may be due to Nick Selby. Um, some of you, um, so I'm sure that he, uh, uh, maybe, Patty, eight million, what's the number? Six, six, six million hit, uh, views in various platforms, and so I'm sure that that had some input to it. Uh, but we have uh, an all-time high for women. Again, for the sixth year in a row, it's the best qualified and most diverse freshman class in Georgia Tech history. So we're excited to welcome them. Uh, Facet starts soon and we'll, you'll see them walking around campus, but it's getting more and more competitive and I'm glad I'm not trying to get into Georgia Tech. Um, the campus, we continue to work on the campus and try to update, uh, make improvements to the campus. You see a lot of work going on right now, actually, over on Cherry Street, on First Street, across from the Marcus Nanotechnology Building, uh, some repairs to the sidewalks. I was joking with Chuck Road that that sidewalk across from First Street might have been the worst sidewalk on campus, but it's an opportunity with the students, a lot of the students gone for us to upgrade that. The Cherry Street renovations there are some steam and condensate lines, a continuation of that project and that'll kind of finish the whole uh, steam and condensate uh, portion of the project on the hill. But we'll continue to update. Uh, you may have seen the uh, new campus markers. Uh, they're up at the corner of, uh, uh, well, the connector on 10th Street and the connector on North uh, Avenue and then uh, there's one down uh, a little bit further on North Avenue, a single one, and we'll continue to try to put those up to mark the campus and distinguish the campus. Uh, continue to improve sidewalks, light poles, lighting on campus, uh, and then have a number of other new projects that I'll be talking about here as we go forward. Uh, just a quick update on the legislature, legislative session and what happened. We had a, a good year with the legislative session. Uh, we received $1.7 million in planning money for the renovation of the Library Towers project. Uh, the good news about that is it's a $1.7 million for design. We'll add about $2.3 million for design uh, to, do, to complete the $4 million design. But the legislature in approving this knew that next year we're going to come back and ask for $40 million 
and the next year after that for $35 million uh, to complete the total project. So they're well aware of that, and, and while there's no guarantee, the fact that they knew it was a three-year ask and they gave us the first year bodes very well for that. But that's a great project for us. We have, uh, as you know, a great partnership with Emory University. We are continuing to expand that partnership. The leadership team from Emory uh, and the leadership team from Georgia Tech meet on a periodic basis three or four times a year and look at how we can collaborate. One of the ways we're collaborating now is to build a joint library storage and retrieval facility out on their Briarcliff campus. So we have signed an agreement with them and we'll be moving a lot of the books out of our library to that joint uh, storage and retrieval facility. Uh, they'll move their books there. You'll still be able to get a book, students still be able to get a book within 24 hours, but we'll be able to repurpose a lot of that space in the two library towers for academic space. So it will become, in the near future, an extension of the Clough Undergraduate Learning Commons where we are today. Uh, it's interesting to note on libraries that when libraries were first started, they were a place where people came together, uh, shared information, and created knowledge. Uh, and then they became a place to store books, and shh, you couldn't talk in the library. And now we kind of come full circle, and the Clough Undergraduate Learning Commons, where we are now, is really serves as the extension of the library, and it's a place where students, faculty, staff, uh, researchers can come together, share information, and create knowledge. And we're hoping to expand that into the, uh, into the traditional library uh, after we, once we move the books out. Uh, that was included in the governor's recommendation, and uh, the governor signed it after it went through the Senate and House. Uh, we also had another project. We now um, recently purchased the Loomis Armored Truck property, which is between Marietta and Techwood Parkway. Uh, that was the last piece of property in that strip that we did not own. So we recently pur purchased that uh, through the foundation, and we are converting that into an environmental health and safety facility. So we will move a lot of the chemical storage, a lot of the things that have been distributed around campus, some of it in the center of campus, out to that Marietta, uh, to the armored truck uh, facility out there. It's a very secure facility, as you might guess. If you keep money there, we can probably keep chemicals there. Um, but it's a secure facility. That was not included in the governor's recommendation, but we got approval from the Board of Regents and the governor's office to try to lobby the legislature and through some uh, hard work from Dean Sheehan and his staff, uh, we were able to get that added in in the House version of the budget. The Senate left it, the conference committee left it, and then the governor left it when he signed that. So that was a four and a half million dollar project uh, that we were able to get added through the budgetary process in much the same way we did with the Chapin building uh, last year. Uh, we supported $40 million repair and re rehabilitation funds for the, US, for the university system to try to understand and calibrate that. We would get about 10% of that. So about 10% of what comes to the system for repair and rehabilitation comes to Georgia Tech. And then the same, uh, uh, the same thing for uh, formula funding. Uh, Board of Regents approved a tuition increase, uh, 9% for resident undergraduates, and then that's distributed over non-resident undergraduates, the same dollar amount, and then a, a concomitant amount for graduate students. Uh, and we, the system received $11.4 million for merit-based salary, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, you can think about Georgia Tech getting about 10% of that. Uh, $1.1 million for merit pay increases from the state. Uh, a 1 percent across the board increase for every employee at Georgia Tech costs about 3.3 million. So that's about three tenths of 1 percent uh, of the raise pool. But I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. So we were excited uh, with the legislative session. We also worked to see some things that didn't happen. And I know not everybody agrees with my particular position on, on some of these issues, but we were able to keep guns off campus uh, again this year, and that took a lot of effort. It was uh, close. And we didn't, see, we didn't see any limitations on uh, research for stem cell research. We didn't see any limitations in terms or changes to immigration. So very, what we think is a very successful year uh, from, in terms of the legislature. So talk a little bit about salary adjustments and what we're doing. Um, we're about two weeks away from notifying folks. We think that we'll be able to notify folks probably by the end of next week or the start of the week after that. We really have a two-phase merit 
increase program uh, that we've undertaken. As you know, this is the first year that we've been given permission to give merit increases. We've actually done quite a few salary adjustments over the past five years through the job classification and compensation system that OHR developed that allowed us to bracket people in fewer number of job classifications with some ranges for those classifications and do a comprehensive uh, adjustment program in uh, several phases. So we were able to do some of that. We included about a million dollars in retention and a million dollars in compression each of the past five years for, for faculty to try to address those. But this is the first time we've had a large scale merit increase uh, capacity. Again, two phases. One is to try to do a limited economic adjustment program uh, uh, that goes into effect May 1st, and in fact, I think, Scott, people have already been notified of that. Uh, that's really directed in, uh, at some of the folks at the lower end of the, of the pay spectrum. Uh, we uh, did something similar to what we did several years ago, and that is did a staggered raise for people under $40,000 and also did uh, a, a living wage, established what we think of as a living wage in that first phase. So we're in the second phase now. Uh, we have received the recommendations from the unit leaders. Those have been reviewed by the administrative units. Uh, the budget office is double checking the numbers. They'll go to OHR uh, in the next day or two. They'll process it, prepare the letters, and they will be notifying people of uh, what we're doing there. Um, they will go into effect uh, for biweekly people on June 26th and effect, effective July 1st for employees that are paid monthly. So we're very excited about that. I know one of the questions I received in advance was about uh, raises and were we losing a lot of people. We're tracking our retention uh, and salary comparisons very, very carefully and our our turnover is in the single digits, which is what you'd normally expect, so we're not particularly alarmed about that, but we appreciate you hanging with us on this, and we're really pleased that the, uh, the state went, went forward and approved this. Again, we received uh, about three-tenths of 1% from the state. We've added considerable amount to that. Uh, to create a raise pool that's fairly substantial, and you'll be hearing about the results in, uh, of that in the very near future. Um, we also have created a staff council. When I came, one of the concerns I had was that there were a whole bunch of people on this campus because of the structure we had with the general faculty, academic faculty, uh, that there were a whole bunch of people that didn't have some sort of representation. So the students had representation through the Student Governing Association. The faculty had representation through the faculty assembly but there were a whole bunch of staff that did not have representation in terms of benefits, uh, health benefits, other types of activities. So we have worked very hard. We've changed the definition. Uh, Dr. Bross uh, worked with his staff and the faculty assembly to change the way we define faculty into academic faculty, research faculty, and we are in the process. Well, we have established a staff council. Uh, and to establish that, what we've done is appointed 20 people uh, that uh, have been appointed this month and they will serve through December 31st. And their really big charge is to try and establish a process for electing the staff council. So we will have an elected staff council probably by December of this, uh, uh, this next year. But to get it started, uh, we identified a number of people and have asked them to serve on the staff council and they've agreed and they'll be meeting to try to understand or try to develop an election process. Uh, so you kind of have to start somewhere. We've developed the initial charge, uh, and this will be an advisory group so that now the faculty will have a way to directly communicate uh, to the office of the president through the provost's office. The staff will have a way to communicate with the office of the president through, uh, up through Steve Swant, the executive vice president for finance and administration, and the students will have a way through their student governing organization uh, through Bill Schaefer's office in the vice president for student affairs. Um, you've, if, you've, if you've been on 10th Street, you've seen the Engineered Biosystems Building. What an amazing facility this is. I saw the plans for this. It's a little bit like the Clough 
uh, building that we're in, when I saw the plans for it, I'm a mechanical engineer and I'm supposed to be able to read these plans and understand them, but when they started building this building, it was a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. And the same is true of engineered biosystems building. It's about the same size as this building. The difference is when you look at this building, you can stand way off and look at it. When you look at the engineered biosystems building, you're usually up close and it just, it's huge. It's huge. But it'll be out on 10th Street. It'll really be the fifth building in that bio uh, quad kind of uh, complex. We'll be in probably, uh, this says scheduled to open June 15th. We're hoping to be in a little bit before then, uh, but things are going very, very well with that. And it's kind of changing that north side of campus. We'll do some renovations on uh, 10th Street there in front of it, lower the power lines, do some other things. But we're very, very excited about that. Um, We've had a great year in terms of uh, national visibility. We had three cabinet secretaries that visited us. Uh, Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker came and, and toured the campus and some of the things we're doing in uh, medical innovation. She went to the, uh, uh, the Global Center for Medical Innovation and looked at that. That was actually one of the initial I-6 grantees. It's a program that we put about uh, the Commerce put about 1.7 million in. We put about the same amount in, and it is self-sufficient today, one year later. It's uh, self-sustaining, and we're very, very excited. It's out on 14th Street uh, in the research building there. Uh, Jay Johnson, Secretary of Homeland Security, came and met with our folks to talk about cybersecurity and some of the exciting things that we're doing in that area. Had both an unclassified and classified meeting. And then Ernest, Ernie Moniz, who's Secretary of Energy, came and, uh, and spoke here with us. Uh, he actually appointed Rafael Bras, the provost, to his uh, Department of Energy Advisory Committee. So uh, a lot of visibility happening there. A lot going on in research, just a couple of things. GT Strudel, engineering software that uh, has uh, been acquired by Intergraph. Ravi Belamkanda, uh, some of the work he's doing in brain cancer. Uh, and then real 3D imaging, that, that is a finger in the middle slide, and that's not a freckle, that is a camera uh, that can image three-dimensionally in your blood vessels uh, real time. Uh, and so some really amazing things that are going on here. Uh, I won't go into to many more of them. Exciting time for students. I don't know if you follow the Inventure Prize, but it's a great event. It's on global public broadcasting. If you've got young children, you've got to watch this program sometime. It'll really excite them. The winners were uh, three young women uh, who actually invented a toilet for third world countries. Uh, it, uh, they won both the first prize, which is $20,000, uh, and they won the People's Choice. So we held it in the first theater, and people could text in who they thought should win the People's Choice, and they won the People's Choice, which was $5,000. And first and second prize come with a commitment from our Office of Intellectual Property to help commercialize it. So we met with uh, the student leadership and Brandy, who's uh, right there, the blonde in the center, is the vice president for the SGA, the undergraduate SGA. We met with the student leadership. She couldn't come because she was in China, and Kenya. in China on her way to Kenya to talk about how to develop this toilet for third world countries. So it's a very, very exciting. This has turned into a great, great event. This is a, a pacifier here that's orthodontically designed so that children, babies that use it a lot won't have to have braces. And it's also designed so that it will change color with temperature so that you can tell if your baby has a fever just by looking at the pacifier. So some really incredible things that are going on there. We continue to make progress on the strategic plan. Uh, working towards the five principal goals that you're familiar with. We've established a team uh, strategic plan advisory group that's chaired by Dr. David Frost from Civil Engineering, and their responsibility and charge is to work uh, with the campus to try to help us identify and prioritize all of the many initiatives in the strategic plan. So some of the things that we've identified in the strategic plan we've already started and are making great progress on. Some of them we have started and will take 10 or 20 years. Some of them we haven't even started yet. And so that job of this steering committee, which is comprised of faculty, staff, and some student representation is to help us prioritize how we move forward in the uh, strategic plan. A couple of things that have happened. The decision to go to the Common App was really an outcome of the strategic plan. Uh, the national re leadership role that we're playing uh, changing the way we teach, and I'll talk about a couple of those as, as, we, uh, as we go further. Um, we continue to try to focus on this idea of what does Georgia Tech think. We want people around the country, and in fact around the world, to ask what does Georgia Tech think. If there's something that's happening in the field of technology, then we need to be involved and engaged. And that's really how we decide. Sometimes people say, well, 
how do you decide what academic programs or what programs you want to be involved in? And basically, if it has something to do with technology, then we want to be in that space. A good example is music. We have degrees in music, a master's and PhD in music technology. We're not trying to train or educate concert pianists, but we're trying to help understand the relationship between technology and music and how technology in influences music. Policy, technology, and how does technology influence public policy or international affairs? And so that's how we kind of make those decisions. But a lot of our folks, and this is just a really quick sampling, on the seven or eight presentations we made to various academic units, I could fill a whole slide for each of the individual academic units that we talked to about the people that we have that are out there talking about the new advances that are going on here at Georgia Tech, the new ideas, the new concepts, and, some of the, and how they'll impact society uh, in the coming months and years. Uh, we are continuing to expand globally. Uh, we just, uh, this past year, have established an international, uh, an office of international development. Uh, it's a new, kind of a new venture for us. We have a full-time development officer in Shanghai, uh, Shelton Chan. Uh, we have a full-time development officer, and he handles Asia, a full-time development officer in Brussels, Leopold de Midlier, and he handles Europe. And we're looking to hire someone in Central and South America. We'll probably locate them in Panama to help us with development. We have alumni all over the world, and we're trying to connect uh, with international companies. Uh, we have a number of those company, international company representatives on our advisory board, but trying to increase the connection and make sure that we're preparing good global citizens. This is a remarkable number. 46% of our students participate in some sort of meaningful uh, international experience before they graduate. For most public universities, that number is 5 to 10 percent. And when I talk to students at graduation, at commencement, and ask them what's the most significant thing that happened to you, what's the, what was the best thing that happened to you at Georgia Tech, they hardly ever say that Calc 2 course. Uh, they almost always talk about uh, study abroad or co-op or internship. Uh, these young people go overseas, uh, they go over, they're a little insecure, not sure, very sure of themselves, and they come back realizing there's a whole big world out there and that they can actually survive in it. And it's just a great, great experience for them. Uh, you've read probably a little bit, unless you've been on another planet, uh, you probably have heard about the online masters. Uh, so about two years ago, we got in the MOOC uh, business. Raphael Bras came to me and talked about this technology assisted learning and said we need to get in the technology assisted learning space. Again, this is Georgia Tech. And we need to be in this space. We offered five courses initially using the massive open online course format and the first day 20,000 students enrolled uh, in those five courses. Today we teach about 12 courses uh, using the MOOC format and we have almost 800,000 students enrolled in those courses. But they don't get credit and we don't charge anything. So it's been a big question nationally about who was going to figure out how to monetize this MOOC phenomena. And we think that we have done that. About a year ago, we announced the first online masters in computer science that uses the massive open online format. We took applications. We received about 2,500 applications, uh, admitted 400 students, 385 of them accepted. Uh, it's going very, very well. Uh, it's going very, very well. We have uh, we had an attrition rate of about 20 percent uh, because a lot of the students, we told them this is going to be just like the on-campus course. It's going to have the same level of rigor. Uh, and what we heard from the students that dropped out was this is pretty hard. Um, and so it seems to be going well and we're very pleased. Again, a lot of national attention, uh, twice on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, and we're continuing to partner with Udacity and AT&T uh, on that project. AT&T gave us a $2 million gift to kind of help us get started. Very, very exciting developments there. Uh, we're working in Tech Square to try and create an innovative ecosystem there. We've, uh, as we did the strategic plan, we talked about what is it that has differentiated our students from the students at other institutions, uh, and we thought uh, there are a lot of things, the ability to solve problems, the ability to think critically, but also leadership and innovation. So we're working hard in both of those spaces. The innovation uh, uh, ecosystem in TechSquare is growing very, very rapidly. We now have Panasonic, um, Penguin Computing, uh, 
ThyssenKrupp, which is a German company, uh, and AT&T Mobility recently opened the uh, innovation centers in Tech Square. And we'll have an announcement in the not too distant future about several other companies that are opening innovation centers there so they can be close to Georgia Tech, take advantage of the expertise, the, uh, the uh, new products, the new ideas uh, that are being developed here on campus. So we're very excited. Venture Lab is ranked number two globally in University Business Incubator. And the Venture Lab is really a, a uh, function of the, the Georgia Research Alliance. So the Georgia Research Alliance is funded by the state of Georgia. They identify technologies that come out of universities and try to fund and invest in those technologies. They have invested in eight technologies since the inception, and all eight of the companies that they've invested in have Georgia Tech roots. Um, so this is something that is, has been very, very successful and is continuing to grow in the, mid, in the space there. So if you're standing at the Georgia Tech Hotel and you look across the street, you see the bookstore and the Scheller College of Business. The lot to the right is that lot right there. That's the front third of the Crum and Forrester building. Uh, you, if you've seen it, we tore down the back two thirds. Uh, and this is a planned high performance computing center. I'm not sure that the tower will actually be that tall. Uh, we're working with partners. It, probably closer to 25 stories, but we're looking to identify partners to work with us in much the same way that we partnered with Gateway uh, Properties in the Synergy building. So we would own part of it and they would own part of it. But this will be a, a two or three story data processing facility and then offices here with corporate partners, some of our researchers. And so this is the bookstore down there on the first floor and the College of Management up here. And we would be standing at the Georgia Tech Hotel. Uh, just because it may be of interest to you, it doesn't directly impact, well maybe it does directly impact the campus. Uh, but that Arby's that used to be right there uh, is gonna be a drive-through Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, don't, we don't have any investment in that, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, they, they, you, Mark, uh, Michael does. So they've, they've closed the Arby's, but they're gonna be putting a drive-through Starbucks there. Uh, they'll still keep the Starbucks over here in the basement, or in the bookstore, on the first floor of the bookstore. Um, update on the capital campaign. Uh, I think most of you know that we started a capital, we did the strategic plan, then we announced a capital campaign about four years ago with a goal of $1.5 billion. We're now at $1.35 uh, billion. We're going through December of 2015, so we've got about another 20 months, uh, 18 months to go. Um, and we're making good progress. The funds for that are going to a lot of the renovations that you've seen, a lot of the new buildings. They're also going to create 100 new endowed chairs and professorships. That was the goal, to create 100 new endowed chairs and professorships on campus. When we started the campaign, there was uh, one in eight faculty members held an endowed chair professorship. Today, it's one in five. And when we're done with the campaign, it will be one in four. The goal was to raise 100 new chairs and professorships, and we've raised 79. So to meet our goal, we have to do about one a month. And that's what I was doing last night, was trying to get the one for, for May. Um, uh, and uh, so that's very exciting. But construction renovations, and also allows us to do a lot of things that we couldn't otherwise do with state money. So it provides tremendous flexibility. We have a great group of alumni, tremendous group of alumni. And in fact, we set goals for each of the uh, I'll say groups of individuals that might be associated with Georgia Tech. The alumni, we had a goal, uh, fundraising goal for alumni, we had a, a fundraising goal for corporate partners, we had a fundraising goal for, and we had a fundraising goal for faculty and staff. And we have vastly exceeded the fundraising goal that we set for faculty and staff. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that and very thankful for you, uh, to you, and for everything that you've done. We're coming up on the SACS 10 year reaffirmation. Uh, process. So every 10 years, uh, SACS comes in and accredits the institution. Uh, we are, as part of that process, we have to identify what's called a QEP, a Quality Enhancement Plan, uh, and we have identified that plan. It was a campus-wide effort driven by the faculty to try to identify what our campus uh, QEP would be this, this time. Just to put it in context, 10 years ago, when we went through accreditation, the two, we, we had two QEPs. One was the international plan, to increase the study abroad program. The second was undergraduate research. And if you've 
been here for a while, you've seen how much that's grown, and so both of those were hugely successful for us. The plan for this time uh, is really uh, focused on sustainability and service. Uh, so we have uh, Dean Catherine Murray Rust is leading the SACS accreditation team. Uh, they've been working on it for about eight months or 10 months, and you saw on the previous slide some of the, the timing of that. But they'll be on campus. Uh, they'll have a visiting team here. We've been told who the team chair is and some of the team leaders, uh, and we're looking forward to having them come. And if you're asked to provide information, because there's a huge amount of data that we have to provide, just tons of data that we have to provide to them in advance of their visit. And so I know many of you have already been working on that, but we appreciate that. But if you're asked, if you'll, uh, if you'll, if you'll help be responsive, uh, we'd really appreciate that. We missed five days of class this semester. Uh, and some of you got five days of vacation. <laughs> um, that wasn't real great weather during the vacation, but we had uh, a great team effort here at Georgia Tech in response to the snowstorms. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a mess all over Atlanta. We, not one of those things that you'd really like to see where Atlanta, I had a lot of our friends uh, that were, we came from, Val and I came from Boulder, Colorado, and they sent emails, half an inch of snow, hmm? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, they feel like that shouldn't shut the whole city down. But as Dean Sheehan says, Atlanta only has one snow plow and they don't like to take it out in bad weather. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we made it through and it was a great team effort. We appreciate everything that you did and I apologize for some of the inconvenience, the inconveniences some of you had to bear. I know some of you were in cars for a long time. We tried to manage it as best we could. I tried to get out in front of it, but we made it through. The students made it through and things worked out pretty well. We did set up a schedule. Uh, one of the things we tried to do is set up a schedule for classes so that faculty, when they rescheduled classes, wouldn't reschedule them all at the same time. So it was kind of like a final schedule. We said if you have a Monday, Wednesday class at 9 o'clock, uh, then you should have your makeup on Thursday night at 7 uh, during this week. And about half of the faculty actually used those times. Uh, about a third of the faculty actually used those times. A third of the faculty said uh, that we'll just try to uh, make it up in the regular class. And the other third of the faculty, I think, use the old traditional Georgia Tech approach that if I don't cover it in class, I'll cover it on the exam. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I want to, I'll stop there and thank all of you uh, for helping make this such a special place. I know you've worked hard, continue to work hard. This is a great, great institution. Uh, we've got a lot of positive momentum. I feel really good about where we are and the tra trajectory we're on, and it's really because of the people that are here and the hard work that you do every day, day in and day out. So thank you very much and be happy to try to answer some questions. Can I click it one more time? Any questions, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Just a quick comment. Oh, the mics are coming. Will you? No. We're recording. And there's another one up here, Laura, right here. There you go. Uh, Bud Peterson briefly mentioned Panama. I just thought it'd be of interest to oh, this yeah. group that the new president of Panama recently elected as a Georgia Tech graduate industrial engineer. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Juan, Carlo, Juan Carlos Varela. Juan Carlos Varela. He's on the Georgia Tech Advisory Board. He was previously vice president. Uh, and the fellow that... Uh, the gentleman that is uh, in charge of the expansion of the Panama Canal is also a Georgia Tech alum, Roberto Roy. So when the mayor and the governor went down to Panama to visit them, we were able to help arrange some of the visits that they had uh, because uh, of the relationship we have with those folks. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment to make. Um, I am a staff person that has been here a long time, and I just want to Thank you for all the good news that you shared with us today. It's been quite a while, I think, that we've heard such great news. And um, I want to thank you for that, and especially for the Starbucks, the drive through Starbucks <laughs> that is coming through. I didn't have anything to do with that, sorry. <laughs> and the staff council. I think that is a huge thing for me. I've been wanting that to happen at Georgia Tech, and I really appreciate that you're the president that's helping to make that happen here for us. And I hope we all will participate in that. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Peterson, I have a comment as opposed to a question. Um, the economic adjustment uh, living wage affected quite a few of my employees, and many couldn't be here today, but I wanted to thank you personally for them. I know some emailed you personally, 
but that changed many of them, their lives in a positive way. So we want to say thank you again. Well, listen, this was a, is a team effort. We've got a great leadership team. Uh, that's something that we've wanted to do for quite some time. Uh, Val and I had actually talked about it. She had mentioned it uh, at some point trying to do that. And uh, Steve Swant and Raphael Bross, Steve Cross, Scott Morris, the people in HR, there are a lot of folks that participated in that and helped make that possible and helped bring it to fruition. But it, it's, a, it's a good thing, and I'm glad we were able to do it. Go ahead. Thank you. Other questions? OK, this is, the time, this is about the time I say I'm going to have to start talking about thermodynamics. So we had, a couple, we had a couple questions that came in in writing, and maybe while you're thinking, I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, answer those. Uh, one of them was, who enforces ethics, the ethics code at Georgia Tech when HR said they only enforce Georgia Tech policies? Uh, actually, the enforcement of the ethics code is a responsibility that all of us bear. Uh, it's, uh, Five or six years ago, we had a, the whole PCARD, huge PCARD issue. We implemented some training processes, the annual ethics certification, and it's really up to all of us to try to enforce that. Uh, it's going to be a continue, it's going to take a continued effort, a continual effort on all of our parts. Uh, it's one of the reasons we ask you to take the annual ethics training so that you'll know what the policies are and you can help us enforce those policies. It's also uh, we're going to have to use the same approach. As you probably are aware, the Board of Regents has passed a, uh, a tobacco ban <laughs> that uh, Lynn's holding a note up here. A uh, tobacco ban that goes into effect October 1st. So it's, we will be a tobacco-free campus on October 1st. And we are developing some uh, smoking cessa cessation plans. Uh, so right now, we have areas where you can't smoke. Uh, and on October 1st, by uh, a decision made by the Board of Regents, the campus, entire campus, will be not smoke-free, but tobacco-free. So if you, if you uh, need some help with a cessation, cessation, pro, uh, cessation program, then you can contact Scott Morris and his folks over in OHR, and we'll try to uh, see if we can help that. That's going to require a campus-wide effort. I don't want our campus police going around writing tickets for people that are smoking. They've got better things to do. But it's going to require kind of the same thing that many of you do when you see people walking on the grass. You just say, don't walk on the grass. You know, walk on the sidewalks. So we don't have all these cattle paths. The campus looks beautiful. We don't have uh, cattle trails like uh, a lot of campuses do. And I think it's because there's this kind of groundswell of support from the campus community that says, you know what, we're just not going to walk across the grass all the time. We're going to try to stay on the sidewalks. Smoking, the smoking or, or the tobacco ban is going to require the same type of effort. Uh, so other, other questions. There's one here and one in the back. Uh, Laura, if you want to get the mic to the one in the back. We talked a lot today about recent successes and things we've done in the, in the past, but we didn't hear a lot about the future. What do you see as our key challenges as we look forward? Uh, number of number of those. Probably the biggest one that we face continues to be uh, of a budgetary nature. The student to faculty ratio is a big concern. Uh, we five six years ago the student to faculty ratio was 21 to one. Uh, we wanted to go to 18 to one. Uh, we're now at about 23 and a half to one. So we've kind of gone the wrong direction. We've added about 100 new faculty positions in the past five years. 80 of those have been filled. There's about 20 uh, that, are, that are vacant right now where we've got searches going on. So the student to faculty ratio continues to be an issue for us. Uh, declining state revenue or declining state resources. Our budget just from a 30,000 foot level is $1.5 billion. Half of that is research. Of the remaining 750 million, about 200 million is, uh, 220 million is from tuition, 180 million is from state appropriation, 125 million from gifts and uh, expendable gifts and income on the endowment, and the remainder is really auxiliaries, things like housing, where the housing, we expect housing to uh, uh, be a break even, kind of an enterprise that operates in and of itself, so we don't expect to make money on housing, we don't expect to lose money, so we borrow money. We charge rent. We use the rent to, to pay the bonds and maintain the housing. So we have housing, parking, dining services, the CRC, and the health center. 
So that 180 million we get from the state today, six years ago was 300 million. Uh, so we've uh, lost 120 million in state appropriation. We've recovered about half of that or a little bit more in terms of tuition, but we still face some challenges along those lines. We've been able to accommodate some of that uh, budgetary reduction through improved processes, uh, the, through the uh, electronic TNLs, uh, e-procurement, and some of those things. We've rolled out a number of those types of uh, uh, business practices that uh, have improved the operations uh, and efficiency, and will continue to do that. Uh, but I think that student-to-faculty ratio and the increased pressure uh, from the number of students, uh, probably the thing that, one of the things that concerns me as much as almost anything else is, is the fact that we are denying admission to a whole bunch of young people that I know could come here and be hugely successful. Uh, but we just have a certain capacity and we can only take so many students and ensure the quality of the education that we can continue to provide. Uh, probably the third one would be uh, what's happening in the federal landscape with respect to uh, federally funded research. Research is a big part of what we do. It's half of our budget. And I don't think very many people believe that the federal budget and the federal support that's available for federally funded research is going to start increasing anytime soon. NIH budget's going down. NSF faces some challenges. And so we're going to have to identify some alternative revenue streams to help us maintain uh, the quality of the education that we're able to provide. In the back. Hey, I wanted to ask a question about um, parking, because we get increases, but parking keep increasing. So within the next year, uh, how many times will parking increase and where is the money going? Okay, so let me take a shot and that's why I asked Lance to be here. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it and then I'll slip out the back here and, and leave, it to, leave it to Lance. Great question. Parking is one of those, parking is one of those auxiliaries I talked about. Uh, so parking is a separate auxiliary. We don't try to make any money on parking, but we try not to lose money on parking. We have tried to hold down the costs and the increases on parking uh, over the course of the past several years, uh, and they do continue to go up. The cost of fuel, the cost of facilities uh, increases. In terms of uh, what the future portends, where the money goes, all the money for parking goes back to parking. Uh, so all the money that's that, you gen that we generate in parking fees, all the money we generate in fines and in tickets uh, goes back into the pool to help improve and maintain uh, the parking. So Lance, I don't know if you want to uh, say anything or if you're happy to just sit there and smile. I'd be happy to meet with her uh, If you want to come down and chat with Lance afterwards, that, that'd be great. Uh, and he maybe can you can answer any other questions that you have. Any others? I had one more that we had submitted in okay. advance, if you want. It's just, it's a little lengthy, so I'll read it. Uh, the revised job classification system have widened the ranges and combined many of the previous job titles we had at Georgia Tech. Many titles that used to be a promotion are now considered lateral moves. A department can offer a higher salary to someone who uh, was not affiliated with Georgia Tech, i.e. hiring outside of Georgia Tech but is unable to do that uh, for a Georgia Tech employee. It would seem that a Georgia Tech employee should have the advantage since they've been trained and are familiar with the required systems in place, things like Buzzmart, financial ledgers, travel, et cetera. Did you have any comment on that question? Uh, yeah, a, a couple of things. One, there's, that's a bit of an ur urban legend. I'm sure, we can, I'm sure you can find individual cases uh, with the amount of turnover we have where someone from outside was paid more than someone from inside. But we did a comprehensive study on that particular issue and didn't, didn't find any consistent evidence that we're paying people from outside more than we're paying people from, in, from inside Georgia Tech. We do try to give first priority to Georgia Tech employees for new positions that open up and try to give them uh, the first opportunity to, for those positions. Um, the job compensation and classification system did compress the, job, the number of job titles. But when we came, and I can't remember the numbers, but we had an, an incredible number of job titles. 4,500 4, job titles. I was going to say four, four or 5,000, but 4,500 job titles for 7,000 employees. 
Um, and we had, to, uh, we had to do something. So we created these bands, job classifications that are fairly broad, and then bands within that classification are steps, if you would, and then did a comprehensive review of that. We just had a consultant that came in and reviewed the job compensation and classification system, this JCCS, uh, and it received actually very, very positive reviews. So again, a little bit of an urban legend there. Uh, you can find, probably find individual cases, but we think from a comprehensive perspective and overall perspective, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, there was one other question about uh, raises, but I think I answered that yeah, one. You answered I, that I think one. I answered that one during the discussion. So. Um, what, any final, final questions? I think we're going to wrap up here. I want to do one thing before we go. Uh, many of you, when I mentioned Nick Selby, many of you uh, uh, smiled or laughed a little bit, snickered. Uh, Nick did a great job. Uh, but I want you to know he's just one of about 21,500 spectacular students here. Every year at the freshman convocation, we ask a sophomore to uh, give some advice to the freshman. And that's what Nick was doing. Uh, but each year at commencement, each ceremony at commencement, we just had three a couple weeks ago, we have the students audition uh, for what we call a reflection. So they kind of start off the program. This is the reflection that was given uh, during the master's and PhD ceremony on Friday night. For as long as I can remember, people have been telling me the same things. Nekabari, one day you're going to do something great. While I'm not sure what it will be, where it will be, or when it will happen, I am sure that there's something special about you and that one day the entire world will know that too. And thus, inundated with the constant reminders of the great expectations of others, I've lived life every single day in constant critique of myself always asking one small but very fundamental question, have I done enough? Have I read enough books? Have I met enough people? Have I made enough A's? Have I traveled to enough countries? Have I done enough for me to look back at my life over the past few years and feel proud about how far I've come? Two years ago, the answer to this question was yes. And then something interesting happened that changed that. I graduated from, let's say, another well-known institution of higher learning in the state of Georgia, situated in a college town not too far east of here known as Athens. <laughs> and I enrolled as a wide-eyed graduate student here at Georgia Tech. And as you can probably imagine, after just a couple of weeks here on campus, my then high and mighty perceptions of the concept of enough got moved up a few rungs. Never in my life had I been surrounded by so many people who demonstrated such a fervent desire to change the world around them and not just live in it. And thus, being the naturally inquisitive person that I've always been, upon beginning graduate studies here at Georgia Tech, I asked myself yet another question. What is it about this place, this Georgia Institute of Technology, that has the ability to attract students from all walks of life and from the furthest corners of the globe? I've asked myself this question every day for the last two years, and it wasn't until about two months ago while I was at home relaxing during spring break <laughs> that I got my answer. And the answer was this. The Georgia Institute of Technology is one of the few places in the world in which the concept of enough doesn't exist. You see, because enough implies sufficiency, and sufficiency implies an end. If one studies enough, then one need not study more. If one learns enough, then one need not learn more. And if one does enough, well, then one need not do more. As I look out into the crowd this evening and see students representing different countries, different areas of academic focus, and ultimately different walks of life, I realize that the very thread that holds us all together and forever binds us to the great legacy of this institute is this belief that enough, ironically, isn't enough at all. It is the belief that enough is nothing that wakes us up every day, picks up our feet one by one, and walks us to the library. It is this belief that enough is nothing that sits us in front of the computer for hours, writing papers, writing code, and running lab reports. And it is this belief that enough is nothing that has landed us here at this very moment today. And so as we graduate from Georgia Tech this evening, I encourage each and every one of you to wake up tomorrow, the next day, and every day thereafter, keeping in mind one single fundamental truth, that being that enough is nothing, and that arriving at this realization is everything. Thank you all, and congratulations.
pretty, pretty spectacular students, and I tell you, I hate to follow these young people on the podium. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and thanks for everything that you do. Have a good afternoon.